Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming my third interview from George Romero's beloved, iconic cult classic, Night of the Living Dead. His name is John Kirch. Um, if you uh, recall, there's this one classic scene where all these zombies are just, are just, you know, in a posse pounding on the door to get in. And there's this little kid zombie right there. Well, that's who John Kirch is. And I'm having him on the show today to talk about his memories and the making of Night of the Living Dead and um, the legacy of George Romero and just how the uh, cult status has effective, has affected his life. And I can't wait. It's going to be really exciting. I just love interviewing people from those movies because it was just an exciting uh, time. And George Romero was just an amazing horror director. And there'll never be another George Romero. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with John Kirch. Well, John... Welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? It's a beautiful Sunday in Pittsburgh. We have a blue sky and the temperature's almost 50. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we've been having really good weather over here in California, and it's only February. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I looked at your location on Google Maps. It looks like an extraordinarily beautiful location. Yeah, I mean, I live in the countryside of Reading, and um, we have pretty bad weather in the winter time. And it looks like uh, the rain's going to be starting up any day now, but it's it's yeah. good overall. Yeah. But uh, it's a central. It's a, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's such a wonderful honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Sure. So um, I know that you were what fifteen or sixteen when you were in Night of the Living Dead. Um, how did you get cast as a zombie? I was a 15-year-old child, and I got to know, to make the acquaintance of Jack Gibbons, who was sort of the post-production sound guy, mm -hmm. although he was also in the press gaggle in the Washington, D.C. scene, and he was a zombie as well, for a ghoul. Mm-hmm. And um, what did your parents think about you doing this? You know, uh, it was interesting. Uh like the, the, the filming of Night of the Living Dead was a, a thing that people were talking about in Pittsburgh in 1967. Uh, we are, as you know, not well known for film production. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this was interesting because it was an, an entirely uh, indigenous, homegrown uh, effort. Uh, so, um, you know, everywhere you go, people will be talking about it. So it was a... Uh, it was a thing that they uh, all knew about. Excuse me for uh, kind of rambling, but um, it's okay. You know, I'll let you too. <laughs> that was sort of, that's sort of what the scene the scene was at that time. Uh, so my parents, of course, were aware of it. It was in it was, they had large newspaper articles and you know uh, lots of stuff like that. So it was um, it was exciting to get it. I was the envy of my high school classmates for managing to uh, be involved in it. And it wasn't an easy thing because, I mean, uh, I was still am a city dweller. Mm -hmm. And as you know, that film was shot out in the sticks in, in the northern county, Butler County. Right. Uh, I would have, if I could have a driver's license at the age of 15, I still would never have found the place. So it was entirely the generosity of Jack Gibbons that I, I had this uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Wow, I, I didn't even realize that um, it was a huge deal before the first frame was even shot because, um, I mean, I know, of course, you know, it's been a big deal ever since it was made, but before that, wow. wow. I mean, no no movie had ever been shot um, in that area? Well, there was a movie called Angels in the Outfield about oh, yeah. a, um, a Pittsburgh Pirates player who's, who is, uh, his game is helped through divine intervention. But that was a Hollywood movie shot here. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't much of that. Since then, there's been many Hollywood movies shot here, as well as, uh, you know, uh, indigenous uh, startup uh, things. 
mm-hmm. but I, 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 you know, I think it could be entirely credited by Night of the Living Dead that this area was discovered as a, uh, a place friendly to filmmaking. Wow. And were, were you a, a fan of horror movies? Oh, yeah, I loved them. I loved them as an adolescent, and, uh, and I was extremely interested in trying to forge my way into a television or uh, film career. Mm-hmm. So, you know, naturally, I wanted to uh, uh, seek this out uh, and, and um, try to be around such people. And I, I came from a really working class area. As, as you know, Pittsburgh was a, a industrial center. Uh, it was all about making steel. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was, uh, that was the sort of people I was exposed to, um, you know, industrial type workers, guys who could make a lot of money without a lot of education in those days. And I wanted to uh, meet people involved in what I wanted my career to be, uh, mainly like, you know, TV film. So it was uh, extremely exciting to uh, get to, that, to the set. And um, the people were also clever. They made clever jokes. They were uh, also, I was impressed that they were welcoming to me. Because uh, lots of times uh, people are bothered by having some uh, kid hanging around the set. And, you know, I was kind of a noisy 15 year old. I had a million questions and I could have been looked at as a pest, but I was never treated that way. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. So you, yeah. you, so you'd just been doing school plays up to that point? I hadn't done, uh, I was trying to make my own movies with a millimeter. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not very watchable to look back at them now, but I was trying, I had no idea how to do it. Uh, School plays, no, not so much, but, uh, you know, later I did theater and, and stuff. I, uh, I haven't done any acting much lately. Mm-hmm. But you were strictly uh, a theater actor throughout your life. Well, that's even exaggerating it. I did do a little bit of theater when I was much, much younger. Mm-hmm. I'm 68 now, so I'm remembering back to being, you know, about in my mid-20s, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Did you did you ever work with John Ampliss? I know who he is. I don't know that he knows who I am. Uh, so uh, no, I guess not. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so what was um, uh, George's process like? I heard he was very collaborative and nice to everyone. Uh, what, my experience with him on the set of Night of the Living Dead was that uh, he was um, mainly involved with his camera mm-hmm. and uh, and surrogates. Maybe it, was, it could have been Gary Streiner talking to us through him, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, but, um, you know, I, the scenes that I'm in were shot real late in the season. And one of the things that Gary Streiner said to us as we were assembled there waiting to do our, our shot was, uh, everybody hold your breath because... Uh, the weather's changed and George doesn't want to see your breath in the shot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we're holding their breath and they're setting gasoline fires around our feet. Nah, you know, it was like that. Yeah. Because it was like summertime when you when the movie was originally shot and this was like, you know, what, fall, winter? It was, uh, it was like October. It was pretty chilly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's in those. I that was in the scenes where they're throwing the Molotov cocktails out the window. Yeah, and uh, they had already had in the can the, the stuff of uh, Carl Hartman throwing those um, fruit jars. Uh, so they needed now the reverse angles of the zombies or those ghouls re- recoiling. Uh, so uh, you know, I guess it was Gary Strainer. I'm kind of guessing dumped. Uh, an accelerant on the ground and just sort of threw a match into it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, <laughs> and we're all back away from that. I think it was extremely hazardous. Uh, it's close to the house and everything else. Uh, I think, you know, you asked me earlier about what my mom might have thought, and uh, I think that she thought it was wonderful that I had this opportunity to go be in a movie, but I don't think she knew that I'd be uh, standing around, um, you know, makeshift gasoline explosions like this. <laughs> yeah, it's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, she might have found that worrisome. Uh, mm-hmm. Jeez, I've lost my, my train of thought. Seems to have derailed. Oh, you're talking about um, about the weather. Oh, 
really. Oh, the weather in 1967 in Evans City. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, there was that incident. And the, another thing that happened, uh, I was on the set when they set George Russo ablaze, if you remember the scene. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was interesting in its makeshiftness uh, in that they just doused his coat with accelerant and two guys stood on either side with blankets and uh, they set up on fire, camera rolling. He uh, stumbles along with his coat ablaze and when he felt his hair singe, he says, he fell down to the ground and the guys came in and put him out with blankets. Uh, <laughs> it was not without hazard. I mean, you know, you'd never get away with this sort of thing today. And I don't know if the filmmakers were like naive or if just nobody understood the protocol that you have to have the fire department handy or you have to have permits for stuff. Maybe that's why they're out in Evan City. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah. You know, that's uh, that's the stuff I remember about it. Um, you know, my uh, participation in this movie is extremely uh, minor. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm in the trailer more than uh, the movie, I think. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long were you on set for overall? I was there for one day, and I came back the second day, and they didn't need any further ghouls, but I hung around and watched them do some takes. With, uh, they were shooting some stuff of Carl Hardman coming up out of the basement, wielding a tire iron with a bruise on his forehead, looking uh, angry. And they did several takes of that. I think what was happening at that point where they were picking things up that mm -hmm. was needed, you know. Uh, I, um, I think most everything was in the can and that uh, Romero was sitting at a movie hall making notes about, okay, I need this shot, I need that shot, we need to shoot this scene. And uh, because when I first met Jack Gibbons, he says, listen, uh, we're, uh, we still have more to shoot, but I don't know when. Uh, just call me every day, and I'll tell you when we're shooting. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. So I did this. I called him every day. It was like after school. I'd come home. I'd pick up the phone. I'd call a guy at work, and I'd get the receptionist. And I'd say, uh, Mr. Givens, please. And she says, can I tell him who's calling? And I'd say, uh, John Kirsch. And she'd say, one moment, please. And then she'd come back and say, no. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, or actually, he came on the line. He came on the phone and she'd say no. And it was the same thing every day. And I would call him up and go through all this stuff and he'd say no. And I'm starting to feel guilty as an adolescent bothering this adult man at work every day. And so I asked him, uh, listen, uh, I can stop bothering you if you'd prefer. And uh, he says, uh, no, call me every day. And then this went on for a month until one day he said yes. And uh, so he invited me to just uh, come down to the city. I'd, I'd been to Hartman Associates recording studio before. That's where I uh, originally met him. And he just uh, took me in his car and uh, took me home and um, took me to his uh, home and uh, fed me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we went off to the location. It was a great thing. He was extremely kind. He didn't have to do this. His wife was nice. He had two small children. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he doesn't seem to be too much interested in the nostalgia of the film, though. Uh, he uh, hasn't participated in any events, and I really haven't seen him in 50 years. Wow. Yeah, so it sounds to, to me like he was, he was emulating Hollywood in Pennsylvania, you know, with all the waiting and all the suspense and all that. <laughs> well, I think it just sort of comes with it. If you're working on something large like that, you've got to have the time to sit down and figure out what else I need to finish this. Yeah. You no. Know? Yeah. <laughs> How right. How long did it take to put makeup on? Not long. Marilyn Eastman put my face on. Mm -hmm. uh, I sat down in a chair and she uh, she applied it. It was just grease paint. It was, you know, obviously uh, black and white. And it didn't have to be extremely detailed. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of made my uh, eyes look more hollow. It was really all she did. Mm -hmm. um, there's this woman, Ella Mae Smith who uh, lived out in that area. And uh, the story goes that George Romero went around asking uh, people sitting on their you know, porches in, in this farm community if they'd like to come and be in the movie. And Ella immediately said, sure. Uh, and her husband was more skeptical and uh, didn't. Uh, 
But when he saw how much fun she was having, he got involved too. And I remember him being there that night, and they were putting a horrible scar on his hand. Great mm-hmm. gaping wound, they were filling it up with mortician's wax, and it looked just great. And the reason they were doing so much detail of him was because he's the guy who picks up the brick and smashes the window, if you remember the close-up of the yeah. hand with the brick. That was that gentleman. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, it's fun. There's it real people in this movie. Nobody was actors really. So, of course, the stars were, were uh, trained. But, I mean, it had actual city of Pittsburgh police in it. Uh, local television and radio personalities were in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, oh my God, what a uh, what a big project for. Uh, I mean, because it, of course it's Romero's maiden voyage, and he was really just a young fellow himself. Yeah, uh, it, it's kind of remarkable to have pulled it off, and I'm very happy that the film is so well remembered. Yeah, Chili Billy Cardeal was in it. Were you a fan of his? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, I'd stay up Saturday night to watch everything he had to offer. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a great deal of fun. It was a good uh, horror show. Um, and he did so many uh, corny uh, bits. And so uh, it, it was um, it was fun for all of that. Yeah, I've interviewed his daughter, Lori, who was in Day of the Dead. She's an awesome lady. Um, Judith, yes. o- Judith O'Day, I've interviewed her, too. She's a sweet lady. Um, did you get to talk to her? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, she's um, she's great to talk to. Uh, you know, I, I can't say that I uh, know these people, but I did talk to her a good bit. I wondered if she was actually a Pittsburgh native. Uh, and actually, her parents had come from someplace else, and uh, there she was, in a kind of nice neighborhood. She lived at Mount Lebanon High School. Mm-hmm. And she told me she was accepted at CMU. CMU's uh, very fine drama department, but turned it down because she was already getting work as a teenager. Yeah. Uh, although she says she regrets not uh, having gone to college. Um, you know, uh, she did okay anyway, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think she's from Philly. From Philadelphia, is she? Yeah, okay. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Dwayne Jones, what a groundbreaking and somewhat controversial role he had in the movie, and so many people admire him to this day for it, you know? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I, I didn't try to approach him. He, uh, he was kind of intense, and, uh, <laughs> you know, but I remember at the, at the premiere, they, they were kind enough to remember to send me tickets to the premiere, and I went to the premiere, and he had the most dazzling tuxedo mm-hmm. involved the cape. He had a cape. And I thought that was just just great. He looked wonderful. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you went to the premiere for the movie. What was the the reaction? Uh, it was a thunderous applause. You know, it was a friendly audience. Uh, and um, it was uh, great. And I remember going afterwards to the, uh, they had a, a, a cocktail party afterwards. I didn't get any cocktails, but I had a chance to sample caviar, which was so exotic. Never thought I'd have a chance to taste that. Uh, (laughs) So, uh, you know, that was uh, pretty wonderful. It was just so so posh and so beyond anything I'd ever experienced previously. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of of people in the audience screaming and just excited? um, They sat me down with all the stars. So, like, Carl Hartman was right behind me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so they were just interested to see the thing intact. It was, you know, they were, they were, they were, they were growing up some professionals and friends in, in that audience. Um, but I'll tell you that I turned 16 the following January and got a job at a local movie theater and Night of the Living Dead came to that screen. <laughs> and that was like largely adolescent audiences who had so much fun with it. Uh, I, you know, I remember them uh, laughing and applauding the line, they're coming to get you, Barbara. <laughs> uh, and this was in 1968. It was a brand new film. You know, uh, it mm-hmm. brought a lot of people out to the movie theater just because it was so long anticipated and it was a local product. Uh, you know, people wanted to see Pittsburgh, although you don't see the city in it. 
uh, there's all those supers with familiar names, and many of them got applause. Mm-hmm. In, in addition to uh, the, the premiere, was there a rap party for it that you know of? So if there was, I wasn't involved in that. Oh, okay. So what, so 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 after the movie, um, were you, so uh, did you just? Uh, I, I know I asked it before about uh, about you doing theater and stuff. So you just stuck to theater and you just decided to uh, work a normal job. Well, I'll tell you, I stuck in that normal. Uh, I uh, I went off to uh, Los Angeles to the California Institute of the Arts where I studied film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I came back and I wound up getting a job at the film lab here, WRS, the Motion Picture Lab. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there, I got some work at uh, the PBS station, WQED. And I did a bunch of industrial things and finally got a job at, in television news at KDKA Television here in Pittsburgh, where I worked for 35 years. Uh-huh. I'm retired now, almost two years. I'll be retired two years at the end of April. Mm-hmm. Congratulations! Uh, Thank you. Absolutely. So you, so you kind of stayed in the um, in, in the film business, you know, and just you know behind the scenes then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty close to what I had in mind for my uh, life. It wasn't bad. I got to edit uh, film and then video and then digital for my, uh, and they paid me for this, so that was fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you think about the the, um, the natural progression of, of going from film to digital? Well, you know, my dad was an electrician who uh, who became interested in electricity when uh, when radio came in in the twenties, and uh, so we went off to technical school and learned all about radio, and it was like uh, you know tubes and so on. Yeah. But by the end of his career, he was uh, working on integrated circuitry. And uh, so, uh, you know, he made the same transition. It's just you have to keep up with the technology if you want to eat. Mm-hmm. When, when did you realize that Night of the Living Dead was such a cult phenomenon? Uh, I, don't know, I knew it had an enduring popularity, but I went and saw a screening at a theater uh, that had uh, all the, uh, you know, surviving uh uh, production members there mm-hmm. and um, that's when I actually they had no idea who I was or anything or my connection to the film and a friend of mine stood up and outed me and uh, that was kind of incredible so uh, Russ Strainer says come up here come up here and I go up on the stage and they gave me a microphone to say some stuff mm-hmm. and flash bulbs went off and I thought ooh silly gosh um, it was kind of remarkable so I guess it was maybe when I started meeting the uh, fans of the movie that I realized that it had such a widespread appeal. Uh, it is amazing because, I mean, you know, at the, at the festival held in Evan City every October, uh, one meets people from all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. Uh, I've seen people come as far as Australia and Europe. Mm-hmm. Did you start taking uh, part in the reunions after that? Yeah, uh, when was that? It was probably something like 2012 or 13. And I've, I've been going out to those things and uh, meeting fans of the movie and uh, getting to know, uh, uh, you know, um, some of the other people. It's been very nice. Uh, it's a great deal of fun. I look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Did you see the uh, remakes? Yeah, uh, I, I did see them. I thought there was one remake. There was one in 1990 and one in 2009. Why don't I know about the 2009 one? Probably because it was terrible. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, uh, I don't have, I haven't seen that 1990 color version in a while. Uh, if I remember, I thought it looked pretty good. Mm. Yeah, I like the 1990 remake. I, at, the, at the time... You know, I didn't think it was as good as the original. I think it's just as good now, looking back. Um, I know that there were some issues uh, during the production of it, but it's pretty good. I think Tom Savini did a good do- good job directing it. 
you know, and he he was supposed to do makeup on the original, but he got drafted to Vietnam. He did. Yeah. At least that's the story that he tells everyone. I asked John Russo about that, and he said it's not true. But I, I don't, I don't know who oh, to believe. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> he's another one of those guys. He's very, very famous, as you know. Yeah. He did a, he did a, he did a Simpsons episode. So that's my measure of fame right there. When somebody animates you in the Simpsons. Oh yeah. But he's from this neighborhood that I live in presently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've seen him around here. <laughs> I saw him once standing in front of the local bar, but I, I, I haven't approached him or spoken to him uh, because uh, he, he has so many people pestering him. Yeah. I, I've met him a couple of times at conventions, and he just he looks like he just doesn't want to be there, you know? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Well, yeah. He, 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 some, some of us, you know, have, like, have people who are actually fans of them, and some of us are nobody, and so it's more fun, perhaps, if you're nobody. Yeah. He was especially like that. The, the, he was he was especially like that the first time I met him. Second time, he was he was actually in a good mood because he had been honored at the after party the night before. So I actually got to have a conversation with him the second time. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. He's a, he's a majorly talented fellow. He's a very talented guy. Yeah, not just in makeup, but you know he he acts. He does you know behind the scenes stuff too. I mean he's. A very talented guy. Yeah. Did you um, keep in touch with George after the movie? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I've had like some minor encounters with him. Uh, he wouldn't know me from uh, a hole in the wall. Uh, I remember once wheeling a viola in for him when I worked at a film lab. He wanted to run something for some people, and his wheel was in. There it is. And then I was out. Uh, he didn't really interact with us. Uh, rules in, in the film, as I said, there was sort of a mediator. He's got that aeroflex, and he's just thinking, I think, about pet stops and so on, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's difficult, I think, to um, to try to direct a movie and be concerned about all these uh, technical matters as well. Uh, I mean, you know, some guys, like, really enjoy working with actors. I'm not quite sure he, he seems to think, from what I understand, that, uh, well, they're actors, so they'll act. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so he doesn't give them a whole lot of, like, direction, give me a little more of this or a little more of that. It, um, he's more of a technical director, I suppose. hmm What was your reaction when you found out he died? I was very sad for everyone involved. Uh, I, I did get a chance to see him at one of the festivals before, the year before he left. And, uh, um, I didn't uh, interact with him at, at that event either. I just sort of watched him from a distance while people uh, lined up to be photographed with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he died uh, a couple of months before I was supposed to meet him at this convention, which ironically got canceled because of the California fires. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a shame you didn't get a chance to meet him. Yeah, I was pretty devastated. I I had always wanted to meet him, and I I thought I had my chance, and then yeah, it was it was terrible. I've interviewed um, two of his uh, two of his uh, former wives on the podcast and stuff. They're pretty, yeah. they were pretty interesting, and they had some pretty interesting anecdotes about him and stuff. Yeah, all right. You keep in touch with anybody from the movie. My what? Do you keep in touch with anybody from the movie? Well, I really, I see these people once a year uh, when, I, when I go out to the festival. Uh, and it's just, it's very, uh, it's very nice always to see them. It's like a, it's like a reunion in and, in and of itself. Uh, they've, uh, they've been very kind and welcoming. Uh, and it's interesting. I'm like the, maybe the, uh, the youngest school in the thing, and I'm an old man, so uh, <laughs> it, it, everyone's getting up there. Yeah. Uh, do you have any um, upcoming uh, reunions that you're aware of that uh, you've been invited to? Uh, I think the only thing is that I uh, have been involved in or will be involved in or know about even is uh, the one in Evan City, the Living Dead Weekend. Oh, yeah. Living Dead Weekend, that's 
been taking off the last few years that it's been around. I've seen, I followed their um, their group and all their posts and everything, and I'm, I'm glad yeah. that, that it's doing very well. Yeah. One of these days I'm going to make it out there, but uh, yeah, it's very expensive. Oh, it's very expensive to fly from California to Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, you're right, it is. Uh, and then when you get here, you're, you've got to get yourself out to Evans City, so you have to rent an automobile. And, uh, and uh, I'll bring it up there. It's just a little town. It's a couple of blocks long. It makes me think a little bit of... Uh, uh, yeah, I can't think of the name of it. it was a, a town high up in... Colorado that makes me think of it. Mm-hmm. I, de- well, I, I def- think of the name. I hope you're <laughs> able to edit this. <laughs> it's okay. I've, I definitely want to see the the, uh, the shopping mall that Dawn of the Dead was filmed at. I mean, is, is that? do you know if that's a, um, uh, a Pennsylvania landmark that's been declared yet? Were they going to do that? Well, I mean, the mall, the mall yeah, that, that uh, they used in Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, the Monroeville Mall. Uh, well, I I don't know anything about its uh, historic status. Mm-hmm. Oh, it should be. No. Oh, I see. It, it should be. I, I thought you were telling me that like that was imminently going to happen. Oh no, no. I mean, I, I was just saying it should be a landmark in, in Pennsylvania because of that movie, because it was so mm-hmm. successful and it's so revered as a movie. You know. Well, yeah. Uh, don't really last forever, and shopping malls are sort of disappearing. Yeah, uh, that is true. I mean, you know, we had an igloo-shaped um, arena for hockey games. Mm-hmm. Uh, a Space Age Wonder built in 1959. That's demolished. Uh, yeah. It was, um, you know, I, what are you going to do? It was just uh, no longer youth, useful. Yeah, so many businesses in, in my hometown up San Mateo, California, and in little town San Francisco, it's just everything's going away. It, it's so sad. Is the tech boom and everything? Oh yeah, right, right. Well, you know, this uh, the city changes itself, and, and, and nothing, uh, nothing stays static. Hmm. Well, John, I thank you for coming on today. This was a tremendous honor, like I said, and. I hope um, I get to meet you in person at one of those reunions someday. I'll be going to them as long as I got breath. <laughs> and uh, thanks for inviting me to be on the podcast. It was very exciting, and uh, I'll be uh, listening for it. Awesome. Okay. I'll connect you on Facebook, and I'll, I'll tag you in this. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. John Kirch. Ain't he a cool dude? Uh, Wow. Never heard about that side of George Romero not uh, responding to actors and zombies and what have you. But, you know, everybody's experience with somebody is different. So I don't discount that. But still, great stories and a great tribute to George there. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.